morning, Pioneer family. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we're going to worship together this morning. Amen. Um, those of you joining online, thank you for tuning in. Um, we're just getting things situated right now, but we are going to get started with some worship. Um, God has already been moving in just a powerful way uh, this morning, and so we just want to lift him up today. Um, so I'm going to pray before we get started. God, we just thank you how, of how good you are, that your goodness, um, it goes beyond anything that we could ever do, Father, that it's not dependent on us, but you're good, and you're, you're the only thing that remains true, Father. So we thank you, God, that we can lift your name up this morning and declare how good you are, how faithful you are, no matter what we're, we're facing in life right now, God, if, even if we've just received devastating news, we can still declare that you are good, that you are good. So God, we lift you up this morning. We lift you up and we declare that you're good in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship with us.
I just read this morning in Hebrews that you are our great high priest and what you did, the sacrifice you made, it doesn't have to continually be made because what you did, it was once and for all, it was paid in full that one time because you are so good. There is no other God like you, no other God like you, no other name that we need to praise today than the name of Jesus. Come on, just lift up the name of Jesus in this place this morning. God, we worship you that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are true. You are true, God, you are faithful. You are our great high priest. And because of what you have done, we now can enter into the throne room. We can experience the Holy Spirit every single day. And you're so good because of that. So good for the sacrifice you made. Thank you, Jesus. As we move on to this next song, the theme is just declaring the goodness of God. That is the theme for today. But these words, just talking about how faithful God has been. And when we think back of the times in our lives where he's been so good, you just can't help but praise him. You can't help but lift up his name because he's so faithful. And even if you're in a circumstance where you haven't seen him come through yet, you can still declare because of what he's brought you through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amen. Because Amen. of his forgiveness, because of salvation, even the fact that we are in this room today, 
That is the faithfulness of God. Amen. So let's continue to sing how good he is today. Amen.
think about that day. <laughs> With shout of acclamation and lead me home. What joy shall fill my heart and I shall abide with humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great the Lord this is my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art and how great Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. We worship you, God. Sing it out to him. 
Amen. And if y'all were uncomfortable with that, you better get used to it because that's what it's going to be like in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. Yes. We're going to be lifting him up for all eternity. I can't wait for that day. But welcome to Pioneer Church. Thank you for joining us in worship today. We're about to transition from one time of worship to another. We have some announcements coming, and then Pastor Jeremy is going to bring a word today. But before we do that, as we transi transition the stage, if you could greet the person next to you, say hello to somebody maybe you haven't seen in a long time or someone you've never seen before, and we'll be right back with some announcements. Amen. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning, Pioneer Church. All right, y'all are a little more lively than first service, um, so thank God for that. Y'all had a little bit longer to get the coffee in you and get woken up, right? Um, my name is Pastor Jerry. I am the executive pastor here at Pioneer Church. I'm going to share a few announcements before Pastor Jeremy gets up and shares the word with you. Uh, first off, if this is your first time here, or if you just haven't done this yet, I'm going to encourage you, before you leave today, find that table in the back. There is a Connect card on that table. I want you to fill it out so we can take you out to lunch or dinner or coffee. We want to get to know you, get to know how you, we can get you implemented in this community a little bit more. Um, and then just find out your story. Amen? This is a community. We don't just do this on Sunday mornings. We do this. We had a picnic yesterday at Shelby Farms. A ton of people came out. It was a great time. If you were there, can we just give a little bit of a shout at how great that was, just community? Um, so be a part of that. Come be a part of that with us. Uh, so find one of those Connect cards. Fill it out. Also on that back table, there are flower pots. That's where you can give your tithes and offerings. You can also give at pioneerchurch.com forward slash give or by scanning that QR code. Uh, and finally, the last thing on that table, there's some prayer cards. And if there's anything that you're going through right now that you would like us to partner with you uh, to see God move in, please fill out one of those prayer cards. Drop it in the prayer, or drop it in the flower pot, because we're a church that prays, amen? And we want to partner with you whatever's going on in your life. Uh, the last thing, how many of you are here for baptisms a few weeks ago? That, Come on, can we just give it up for the people who were a part of that, who made that life-changing decision? Said the old has passed away, and I'm standing here a new creation. And if any of you want to make that decision, you say, that, that's me. You know, God's done something in my life, and I want to make that public declaration of baptism. We're going to be doing that again on June 23rd this month. And so if you want to be a part of that, if you'd like to get baptized, please sign up at pioneerchurch.com forward slash events. Or come find me or Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Tasha, someone, and we will get you the information you need so you can get ready to do that. Uh, there's going to be a class during first service at 915 on the third floor with Pastor Cody and Anna. And we would love for you to come be a part of that. Amen? All right. I'm going to pray, and Pastor Jeremy is going to come up. Thank you, God. Thank you for every person in this house. Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in us through Pastor Jeremy's message, and don't let us leave here the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, oh. <laughs> y'all came with a little bit of energy this morning. Um, so good to be with you guys this morning. Isn't that crazy? Like 45 seconds ago, it looked like it was about to downpour. Uh, and now it's the sun's out. Um... So glad to be with you guys this morning. 
the message I want to talk about today, I experienced two months ago. So it's very relevant um, to a lot and what a lot of us go through. There are times, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys, anyone ever experienced where there are times where they are like at the peak of their walk with God? Like everything is going so well and you are taking grounds in the spiritual realm that you are like, you're experiencing massive great victory in God. You're experiencing massive things going on in God only to be followed up with the biggest depression you've ever been through. Right? Anyone ever go through that? Just me by myself? Oh, okay. No, yeah, it's just like you go through this great battle. Like you overcome sin. Like you're driving and someone, and you didn't give them the finger. And you're like, look at me growing in God. And like, you know, like you went to a family function and you didn't curse out a family member and you actually love them. And you're like, man, I am growing in the Lord. This is so fantastic. You're not submitting to any of your addictions anymore. You're actually breaking free and you're getting stronger. And then right after that, a massive depression comes. And you just, you just feel so defeated. And you're like, where is this coming from? And what's the first thing that we think as people? Did I do something wrong? Is there a sin in my life? God, did I mess up somewhere? Like, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening now? And like a couple months ago in men's group, I remember telling them like, guys, I'm at the I'm at this place where I'm having like such an intimate relationship with God and things are going so well, only to be followed up with like catastrophe and depression. I want to first say there are many different expressions of depression. Not all depression looks the same. Not all depression sounds the same. Not all depression feels the same. And there are many different lengths to depression, right? Sometimes we're depressed for a week or two, and then sometimes we're depressed for months. And the most, and the saddest thing you can ever do, hear me Christians, the saddest thing you can ever do as a person, and the roughest thing you can ever do, and I want us to all commit, can we commit to not do this, is to tell someone, why don't you just get over it? That's so, like, unchristlike. And we've all heard it. Someone, <laughs> I wish you would just get over it. And it's just like, if I could, I would. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. But here I am. The Christ-like thing to do and the Christ-like thing to say is, I don't know how long this will take you, but I'm with you through it. I'm praying for you. I'm with you. You can call me. You can text me. I'm with you through it. There are some types of depression that need to be diagnosed and treated medically. Let's be real. We all have bodies where the biochemistry of our brains are not firing correctly. And God has created medicine to allow us to take that to regulate what's going on in our brain sometimes. Because there are times... When, yes, we need to put it all in the Holy Spirit, but there are times when the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you need medicine, and that's okay. You don't need to be ashamed of that. So I want to take that off of anyone in the room who has been told or it's kind of been gestured towards, like, the reason why you're not healed from this is because you don't have enough faith. That's B. That's, mm. You see? You see? You see how angry I get? Because that's happened before. I've heard people say that to people. Oh, the reason why you're still struggling with this is because you don't have enough faith. No. When sin entered the world, it entered our genetics. And that's just the way it is sometimes. And you, don't, you didn't ask for it. You don't want it. But sometimes that's just the way it is. But hear me. There are ways to treat depression. And we're going to talk about the prayer part of it and things like that. But sometimes treating it is education. Right? It's knowing what you're dealing with. So a lot of times it's social support, getting people around you. It's a lifestyle change. It's what you're eating, what you're not eating. Are you exercising? And it's therapy. 
Like, I believe that Jesus can do things all by himself and he doesn't need anybody, any help. But for us, sometimes we just need therapy. We need someone to talk to. And therapy doesn't always have to be a therapist. It could just be someone who just listens. Depression is a... Do you guys know? I did like a brief study of these numbers. Do you guys know that depression is soaring in numbers? And yet, so is social media notoriety. Isn't that crazy? How social media is soaring, but yet so is depression. But yet everyone wants to show how happy they are online. And the moment they're not putting up content, they have to deal with themselves. Depression is soaring. I had a friend in my life. Tasha knows him. But this is before Tasha and I met. If you saw him, he was the happiest guy in the world. Always smiling, always bringing joy, always having a joy. And yet was fighting and eventually ended up losing his life to this depression. Depression doesn't look the same for everybody. Some of us think depression looks like, oh, they're losing weight and they're down. That's not always depression. Sometimes it's like they're gaining weight. They're around people. And they're around people, but they still don't feel seen. They still don't feel heard. Some of us are trying to look for signs of depression doesn't have a sign. It doesn't. But we do have a Holy Spirit who let us know when it's time. Hey, that person, they're smiling, they're joking, but like, talk to them. Get to the root of it. The title for today's message is, Does God Care About My Depression? Does God care? I mean, God's got so much going on. He's got to hold the earth on its axis. He's got to stop the war that's happening overseas. There's so many agendas going on in America. There's so many, there's so many houseless people and poor people. And does God really care about my little depression, about me and how I'm feeling and my emotional? Does he care? Because it seems like he's got a full schedule. I want to let you know that this depression thing isn't a new thing. People have been dealing with depression for a very long time. It's even recorded in the Bible of a prophet dealing with depression. Depression isn't new. But does this big God care about my little depression? And we're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it. So I'm going to set up the scene. There's a story in the Bible. Um, the eighth king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife, Queen Jezebel, they did a crazy amount of wickedness in the eyes of the Lord. They were the king, over, they were the king and queen over Israel to the point where Queen Jezebel had prophets killed who were sent from God, who were sent from the Lord God, Yahweh, to be a prophet to Israel. She had them killed. Matter of fact, she even endorsed them, prostituting themselves to the, in the temple of Baal and at the temple of Baal, excuse me, at the temple of Baal, who was the god of weather for that time. She would say, she would send prostitutes and have prophets compromise themselves and force them. And then if they didn't have them all killed, they're doing wickedness, all kinds of crazy wickedness. And so the Lord appoints Elijah, a prophet, to them. And then it culminates to a... Y'all need to read this. Okay, read it on your own. This is chapter 18. It is so fascinating. You think telenovelas are interesting? No. This, this is something. And it culminates to this battle on top of Mount Carmel where it's the prophet of Yahweh versus the prophets of Baal. And, pro and, and God uses the prophet Elijah. It's only one of him. And then the prophets of ba Baal numbered 450 prophets. Ain't that just like God? He's like, I don't need 450. I could just use one. If he's willing and if he's holy, I just use one. See, all these other false gods, they, got, they need thousands and hundreds. I'm just going to use this one guy. So it shows off, like, so they go into this battle, right? I'm sorry, I'm really getting into this. <laughs> they go into this battle, and, like, Elijah is so, he's so confident in the Lord that he's getting cocky. He's just like, where's your God? 
And like these prophets start yelling and they're like, Bill, come, ah! and they start like getting angry. Why don't you show up? And Elijah over there is like, maybe you should yell a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Literally, I'm not like this is just is it read chapter 18. He's like, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's on vacation. What's going on? Like he's getting cocky to the point where he's just like, they were like, they wanted to, uh, they had two altars set up and they were like, hey, we're going to set this altar on fire. And Elijah gets so cocky where he's like, pour water on mine. Pour another bit of water on mine. And they're like angry. And then he goes and then he prays to the Lord and the Lord shows up through Elijah and he lights the whole thing on fire. And, and they're just like all in awe and Elijah's feeling real good. And Elijah feels so good where he's just like, hey, Israel. Why don't we put to death 450 of these prophets right now because they've been lying to you about who God is. And you just saw the power of the living God move in this situation. So he puts them to death and 450 of them die. And this is where we pick up in chapter 19. Now Elijah's feeling good, right? He's like, you know, he got a little air in his chest. He's like, <laughs> I wish you would. And it says in chapter 19, it says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and now he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message, a messenger to Elijah to say, may the, God, may, the God deals, may the gods deal with me, be it so ever severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. She throws a threat. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to deal with you. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I'm no better than my ancestors. There are two things in the text that stood out to me when I was studying this. Number one, write this down. You are not in sin just because you're being attacked. You are not in sin just because you are being attacked. There are times you are being attacked because you decided to stand on Christ. Because you decided to stand up in your workplace and say, no, 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 I stand for Jesus. You decided to stand up in your home and say, this is a place, this is a home that belongs to the Lord. You decided to stand up in your classroom and say, I'm not going to compromise my morals and my beliefs to serve you. I'm going to stand up for Christ. And so when you do that, you have to understand attack comes. But so many times when, we, when attack comes, the first thing we go do is, what did I do wrong? And maybe we need to switch our mindset to say, what have I been doing right? What have I been doing right? When you stand up for Christ, attack will come. Because while everyone else is kneeling down, you are standing out. You are saying, no, Lord, I have a standard in my life, and I'm not going to forfeit you for any little bit. And so what happens is attack comes because you've made yourself a target. But I'd rather be a target in the kingdom than lay down my life for hell. You haven't sinned sometimes. I think so many times we think like, oh, I did something wrong, God. This is why you're, but no. When you, Elijah was not being attacked because he did something wrong. Even when he was cocky in the Lord, he wasn't being attacked for that. He's being attacked because he stood up. For Yahweh, he stood up for the Hebrew God. He stood up. He says, no, my God's going to show up and show out. And this evil will not prevail amongst Israel anymore. The second thing is, withdrawing doesn't mean you lost. Withdrawing doesn't make you weak. What did he do? He heard the threat and he ran and he withdrew. Write this down. There's a wisdom in withdrawing. He withdrew. 
Matter of fact, he left his servant in Beersheba. He's like, you stay here. I need to get by myself because I'm feeling these things and I'm feeling these emotions and I'm feeling whatever I'm feeling. And sometimes we got to withdraw in wisdom. But hear me when I say this. There are moments in life we need to get alone, but it's what we do in our alone that shows significance. Right? We know that Jesus withdrew. He pulled away from his disciples. He got away from people. But what did Jesus not do? He didn't go on TikTok and scroll for two and three hours. He didn't go to Google and ask, what's the answer to this? He got before the Father in this time. He got before God. He spent time with the Lord. A lot of us are withdrawing, but we're not doing anything in that time being alone with God. And we're giving that time to Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or to a friend. And, and the Lord is like, no, 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 I need you to withdraw because I need to speak to you. I need to strengthen you. And I think so many times we think like, oh, if, if I'm withdrawing, that means like I'm weak or I've lost. No, that doesn't. Elijah didn't lose. Elijah hadn't lost. There's a wisdom in withdrawing. There's a wisdom in saying, I need to pull back for just a minute. I, need to, I need, just need to hear from the Lord. And what we do at that time is so significant. Because look at what happened. Anytime Jesus withdrew, right? It was either he, when he withdrew, he would come out and heal in power. And he would perform miracles and he'd perform signs and wonders. And he even told people, I only do what the Father wills me to do. There's a wisdom in pulling back. There's a wisdom in that. Here he says, he runs away and he goes, I have had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Take my life. God, I'm done being alive. I am done doing this. I'm tired. Just like, take me away. And you don't have to raise your hands. But how many of us have prayed that, own, that same prayer where life gets really tough and you're like, Lord, take my life. The pressure is too much. I don't want to be here. And we say things and we pray these prayers, but thank God that he doesn't answer all those prayers. God, take my life. See, we say things out of emotion sometimes and we don't realize what we're saying and we pray emotional prayers and we're like, God, because Elijah thought in that moment, if you take my life, it'll be better. But thank God he wasn't listening to that prayer because when you think about it, we know we just say things, but we don't really mean it. Think about this. Jezebel just threatened him, tomorrow I'm going to have you, I'm going to take your life. Why would he then run away to ask the Lord to take his life? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So that shows me that in our emotional state, we say things to God that's just like, I don't even know what I'm saying right now. But that's the beauty of this relationship with the Lord is that we can tell him things, not know what we're saying and say, God, take it. And he goes, I'm not going to answer that one. Because you you're emotional right now. You don't know what you're asking for. But it's just so beautiful that God would even listen to that. I think some of us, we think of God as if like, like a boss or like some, some overseer who's just like, if I say this to him, I'm disrespect. If I say these words, he's going to think I'm weak. Baby, he already looks at you as weak. <laughs> you ain't doing nothing. He already looks at you as weak. Why? Because he is your strength. He knows that we as people are fragile. He knows that we are tender. So when we say, God, I'm so depressed. I'm so sad. Like, I don't want to live anymore. I'm tired of it. I've, I've done all this. I just feel. He goes, I hear you. I see you. And I'm not, that's not my plan for your life. But I'm thankful that you're talking to me about it. I'm thankful that you're getting it out. He says, I've had enough. And here's the thing, right? This is Elijah coming off of a major win. This is Elijah who literally just embarrassed the king and queen of Israel. This is Elijah who was like a day or two ago bragging on the Lord. And yet two days later, he goes before the Lord. He's like, take my life.
We prayed that prayer. We say things we really don't mean. This is why we have to remember all that the Lord has brought us through. You see, some of you guys really think that God expects you to be strong all the time, that he expects you to be perfect all the time, that this Christian walk, like I can't mess up because if I mess up, God hates me and he'll do away with me and he's looking to get me and he's looking to write me up or he's looking to fire me or he wants to distance himself from me. That's not why God sent Jesus to die on the cross. He sent Jesus down on the cross so that the blood of Jesus brings us near, that even in our brokenness, even in our frailty, even in our loss, even when we just had a great victory, that when we're down in the valley, he goes, come close to to me. I want you close to me. Come talk to me. I need you near me. I want to hear that you're feeling depressed. I want to hear that you're feeling sad. I want to hear about your anxiety because I want to renew you. I want to restore you. And the only way this happens is if you bring this relationship to me. Thank God that he doesn't answer all of our prayers. That's such a, that's such a good thing for God to do is that he looks at our prayers. And sometimes I don't think he, we say it with our mouth, but he looks at our heart. He's like, you're just scared. I know what you said, but I know what you mean. That's a good God to hear what we say, but to know what we mean. It says, he said, and then verse five, it says, then he lay down under the bush, and fell asleep. Let's be real. So for some of us, the reason why we're struggling with depression is because we don't sleep well. Y'all thought I was going to give you a deep spiritual gift. That is a deep spiritual revelation right there. We don't go to sleep. We don't sleep well. We don't go to bed at a good enough time. Right? We stay up 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and then wake up grumpy and angry. Still struggling. Some of y'all, the, the end of your depression would start if you slept better. If you said, you know what? The TV show can wait. The doom scrolling on social media, it's going to be there tomorrow. It can wait. There are times we have three kids. We put the girls down at 8 o'clock. There are times by 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I'm in bed. And I will wake up and I hear heaven singing. Amen. Because I went to, you, you guys think that sleep is not a spiritual thing. It is a spiritual thing. You want to know who sleeps? Those who are in peace. God, I can't deal with this situation anymore. Lord God, these kids wore me out. Lord God, this job wore me out. You know what? I'm broke today. Why am I going to stay up longer and be broke and tired at the same time? Let me go to sleep. It just doesn't make sense. Some of y'all stay up late trying to scheme out of ways to wake, make more money. And the Lord is like, would you just go and rest? You know what sleep does? If God rested on the seventh day, who are you to not have a Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for you. You know what rest, you know what a Sabbath says? God, I can't, but I trust that you keep on working. It's a gift. It's a gift to have a day off. The people who say no days off are bound for therapy. They're bound for disease. Team no days off. That's team stupidity. That's team foolishness. Because on my day off, I get to rest and say, God, I know you're working it all together for my good. He makes that promise. It's a guarantee. He says, I made this day for you to rest. People work seven days. I'm like, listen, if you have a job that makes you work seven days, you're like, my God didn't even create on seven days. He rested, so I'm going to take this day off. Well, you don't have the hours. Well, I might be sick. I'm just kidding. Some of you guys just need to sleep. There's a power in getting rest. There's a power in going to bed at a decent hour. I promise you that through the night that the Lord is working it out for your good so you don't have to stay up longer. 
Some of us need to create boundaries and tell our jobs, hey, at this time, I got to have my rest. You ever notice the people who stay up late and all they do is work, 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 work? And then if you just watch them, give them six months. Give them six months, watch them. You will deteriorate. You'll actually be more unproductive than productive. You can't even think straight. You can't even think right. You, everyone just agitates. You're always on edge. It's like an exposed nerve that everyone's on. But the people who rest, the people who relax in God, they're innovative. And they're finding new, idea, new ideas to solve old problems. They can solve solutions. Why? Because they've rested. They've rested. So what does God allow Elijah to do? He allows him to go to sleep. You can tell me, oh, I grind all day, every day. I make seven, six and seven figures. That's cool. That's great. There's a lot of people who make a lot of money who don't rest. And they have no peace. You got a bank account full of money and a heart full of sorrow. Make all... Y'all know you can rest because God, don't go, God doesn't go broke. You know that, right? You can sleep well because God's not going to wake up and be like, hey, you got a dollar. That's not our God. God's not going to scratch his head and be like, hey, man, you didn't give your tithe last week. It's looking real tight. And That's not God. You can rest well and wake up because joy will meet you in the morning. But the reason why, for some of us, joy is not meeting us in the morning is because we've spent all night in misery. So, for some of us, depression exists is because we're not finding healthy rhythms to rest. And I know rest isn't only sleep. Rest is also enjoying the time God has given you. Whatever you, whatever you love to do, you do that within your Sabbath. Do that. Enjoy that. That will revitalize you and give you strength. I can't, family, we can't spend our Sabbath worrying about the thing that's about to happen. You can't worry about the past. It's already happened. I wonder if some of us just need rest. Rest for some of us is honestly not thinking about it anymore. Give yourself the mental day off. I'm not going to think about that problem today. Because Jesus says every day got a problem of its own. So, you know, I'm going to worry about that tomorrow. But, 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 are you dying? Is your life in danger? So guess what? I see when I get back. That's not harsh. That's holy. That's not harsh. That's holy. So he goes to sleep. It says, all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and laid down again. Some of us, again, Dep not for all of us, but some of us, depression exists is because we're not nourishing ourselves. Not just physically. This is called the bread of life. And some of us are waking up and not nourishing ourselves, and we're malnourished, and we're stuck in our depression. We're like, why am I so hungry? Well, you, have you cooked some bread? It says he gave him bread and water. Those are spiritual things. Bread and water. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. When you get baptized, you get submersed in water. So, bread and water. Are we spending enough time nourishing ourselves in the bread of Jesus and the water of the Holy Spirit? Are we spending enough time in those moments? Matter of fact, let's make it real. Let's make it something close to us. Some of us, we're, again, we've been in this bout of depression. And I'm not telling you because I'm outside looking in. I've been in depression. And I've had people come into my life and like, hey, let's get lunch. Let's spend time together. And I've been like, no, I want to be by myself. And the Lord is like, I've been trying to nourish you through a friendship. I've been trying to nourish you through a relationship. Because you don't know if that lunch, they speak life into you. And then all of a sudden, you start coming 
coming out bit by bit into your dep- of your depression. Maybe I'm trying to set them up. Maybe I won't send a physical angel, but I could send a friend. I'll send a friend who wants to have dinner with you. I'll send a friend who just wants to listen to you. They're not there to judge you or malign you. I'm just sending them because you prayed the prayer. You prayed, God, get me out. Oh, man, there are times I've been in depression, and I've been so depressed, and a friend calls me, and they're like, what you doing? What you up to? Nothing. Let's go get lunch. And maybe the reason why I didn't heal at that moment is because I've been like, no, no, no. And the Lord is like, I'm sending them to you. I'm trying to get them to nourish you. I'm trying to get, maybe it's just a conversation. Maybe it's just to get you out of that pit that you are in. Maybe if you could just shift your thoughts just a little bit. And I find that when I've allowed those friends to come in and talk and spend time, I look at my life and I'm like, Lord God, thank you for friends. Thank you for family who cares. You know, I... (laughs) That's why you ask the question, does God care about my depression? God cared about Elijah's depression so much that he fed him himself. Think about this. The God of the universe, the God of the universe, the God who's existed before the beginning of time. God so big, sitting and in the throne of heaven. He sees Elijah in his depression. And he goes, angel, yes, go feed him, please. That's it? That's it. Go make sure he's nourished. If you don't think God cares about feeding you, he does. Angel, just go feed him. Sometimes that's why it's so important to have Christian friends because he'll stir up their heart and say, hey, go nourish them. I got a text this morning from someone who used to come to our church years ago. They said, hey, man, God has been putting you on my heart. I've been praying for you. I've been pray- just this morning, I've been praying for you. I'm just, and he says, I'm just a man under orders. I'm just letting you know that God has me praying for you this morning. This is why you need to have people who are so close to the spirit. Because when you don't know that you need nourishment, God sends someone. He's like, I need you to, nourish, I need you to encourage, encourage them. Call them, text them, send them a note. Let them know that they're on my mind. And nourishment, honestly, sometimes, a lot of time, it does have to do with what we eat. If I'm being real. Y'all, y'all know I've started this health journey recently, right? Like, I've been going to the gym and all this stuff. <laughs> there, are some, <laughs> there are some people who just walk in and they're like, and they love the gym. I walk in, I'm like, <laughs> you know? And I find... Now that I'm going to the gym often and I'm working out, like, my eating has changed a little bit. Now I'm eating, like, before you just eat junk food. If I could eat junk food and, and be healthy for the rest of my life, I would. <laughs> I think that's going to be heaven one day. No, don't quote me on that. <laughs> right? But, like, I'm eating things because what you eat does impact how you think. It does. The healthier you eat, it impacts your, the rhythms of how you think. And all my people in the medical field, is that true? Can I get a witness? Yes, there you go. I've got all of two people. And so, <laughs> thus saith the Lord. Um, but what you eat does, does impact how you feel. Like, if you're eating more greens and, more, and healthier foods, you're going to think better. You're going to think better. And so it does impact. But again, it's very similar if you look at your walk in Christ. What you eat determines how you feel. If you spend your time listening to secular music, watching secular movies, doing all the things of the flesh, you're going to desire fleshly things. You're going to desire to eat those things. But if you decide, no, I'm going to spend time in the Lord, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to go to campfire nights, I'm going to be a part of the prayer call. Come on, my prayer warriors, can I get a, yeah. Like, we're on a prayer call, you're going to desire the things of the Spirit. And so what you consume will be what you 
attract, right? And so you have to be careful of like, even in the physical, and there's Christians like, you, this body's a temple, and I am no poster child for like eating healthy because sometimes it's boring. But I do know, <laughs> but I do know it's changed. The more time I spend in the gym, the more I want to eat healthier. Very similar, the more time you spend around Christ-like people in the gym, God's gym, the more you want to eat healthier and do holier things. It affects. It affects. That's why I tell people, like, the church is not a hospital. We are not a hospital. Like, do you, like, I hate when people use that analogy because it's just like the church is a hospital. It's where sick people get healed. I'm like, no, the church is a gym. It's where you come to exercise. It's where you come to learn how to lift them weights. It's where you learn how to come and sweat. Why? So when you leave here, you're doing the holy things in the secular world. This is a gym. You gotta walk, walk out swole. <laughs> Not nah, walk out sore, let's be honest. You know? He says, get up and eat. And then he, he laid down. He laid down again. Verse 7, it says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. He fed him twice. Some of y'all think God is just a one-trick pony. No, he fed him twice. You know, God likes, he could do the same miracle over and over again. It'll still blow my mind. It's like, you did it again. And yeah, see, I pray that you never lose your wonder of how God does things. I pray that miracles never become boring to you. Because some of us, we've got so bored, and you're like, what's a miracle? When you turn on that faucet, that's a miracle. When you wake up and you can walk on your two legs and not feel pain, that's a miracle. Come on, people who are getting older like me. You wake up and you're like, ugh. Well, I'm here on these ten toes still, so God is good. It's a miracle. But we've gotten so accustomed to these things. God did the same thing to him. He says, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate, and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Elijah went into a cave away from everyone and spent the night. How many of us have gotten into our caves of depression and we spent the night? Matter of fact, if we're honest, some of us have spent years there. We've set up home there. In that cave away from everyone. In the cave, we're, we're like, we want to get away from everyone, and we want to set up a home here, and I don't want no one near me. And so this, is, this cave is going to be my cave of depression, and I'm going to be here, and no one can find me. But here's the beauty about God, right? Because we ask our, the question for today is, does God care about my depression? And here it goes. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him. And here's the most beautiful question you will ever see in scripture. God always asks beautiful questions. He always asks loving questions. He always asks us things because he wants us to examine ourselves. This is a loving question. Put it up on the screen. He asked Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And you may be sitting here and like, I don't, I don't see the love in that question, Pastor. That's love right there in that one. What are you doing here? Because if we view God the way we view God as a boss or as the guy upstairs who's just always angry, the cranky God who's always angry, he could have easily said, Elijah, get out of here. I didn't call you here. I called you to the people of Israel. Why aren't you doing what I told you to be doing? Why are you here? You left all the way to this cave. I didn't tell you to be here. See, that's the accuser of the brethren. That's not God. He says, I told you, you should be over there. But you came all the way out here, which is like 150 miles away from where I called you. you you're being disobedient. You're no, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He goes, what are you doing here? Elijah, what are you doing here, man? That's love. Because where he could have accused, he asked Elijah a question to examine himself. I think some of us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're struggling with depression, if we're really honest, the Lord has been asking us that same question. What are you doing here? Why 
Why are you here? How'd you get here? What does Elijah say? He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. God, I've been trying to live righteous for you. I've been trying to do what you called me to do. But it seems like everyone around me is doing what they want. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I've been serving you, and I still have this financial thing going on. I've been serving you, and I still wake up with no purpose. I've been walking with you, and I'm still single. I've been walking with you, and I'm still going through this divorce. What's going on? Anyone else have that conversation with God? And if we're honest, some of us are scared to have that conversation with God because we feel like God's going to smite us or he wants to fire us or he wants to get away from us. But here Elijah is in this cave on this mountain of God by himself, and yet he seeks him out. See, some of us think that God wants to push us away. Do you think the blood of Jesus is there to push us away? You think he sent Jesus on this earth to die a death just so he could push us away? Or did he send Jesus because I want to bring you so close. I will seek you out where you are. So he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? I love this. He says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. So Elijah goes off on his tangent, tells him everything that's going wrong. We do the same thing. We tell him everything that's going wrong. What do you mean we're not, I'm not depressed? Do you not see everything that's going wrong in my life? And what does the Lord invite him to? He doesn't invite him just to stand on the mountain. He invites him into his presence. You see, even in our depression, even when we want to be away from everyone, the Lord is always going to be, come into my presence. Come into my presence. Oh, God, I'm scared. Come into my presence. He invites him into the... You have to understand that depression can't last long in the presence of God. It can't stay in the presence of God. So he goes, hey, walk out to the, to the opening of the cave and I'm going to pass by. What does that tell me? That even in my depression, even in my loneliness, even in my sadness, the Lord goes, come, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to draw closer to you than you can draw closer to me. He says he's ever-present in our time of need. And yet we have voices in our mind telling us that God is not, God does not want to be here in this moment of depression. He doesn't want to see me in the moment of depression because if he see, I don't want him to see me as weak. And guess what? He already sees you as weak. You're not surprising him with nothing because it's in your weakness. He says, my power is perfected in you. He doesn't say in your strength. He says in your weakness, in your loneliness. You see, Scripture says that God draws close to the broken. He draws close to the weak because he becomes their strength. He invites them out. He said, I'm going to pass by. He says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Boom! And shattered the rocks. Before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, and everything was shaking, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. There is no one in ever who can demonstrate power and intimacy at the same time. God demonstrates it. He shows his power through the wind, through the earthquake, through the fire. He's displaying his power. And it says that God wasn't in any of those. But what does he do? There's this intimacy that happens. Anyone ever whisper a secret in someone's ear? Listen, you got to be pretty close to someone to be whispering in someone's ear, okay? Proximity-wise and relationally. 
Because I'm, I'm, what would you do if a stranger came up and whispered in your ear, what the heck? Why are you so close? I don't even like my kids whispering in my ear, just hot breath, just. Do you know the intimacy in that relationship that's needed for God to whisper in his ear? You see, some of us are saying, God, I want you to turn all the other voices down. And God is saying, I need you to focus on mine. He shows him power. He shows him how he can change and, and, and manipulate the elements. But yet he only speaks to him in a whisper. It would be so much easier if God was a shouter, wouldn't it? God, yell at me. But then he goes, but then you're untrained to hear me in the loud moments. God, put a neon, whoever prayed this, put a neon sign in the sky and just point to it. If I put a neon sign, then you'll stop looking for me because it's just easy to see. It's only at a whisper. I've done, if you are, if you're in a relationship or you're married, there are several times in our marriage where I've been like, Tasha, and she don't hear me. Tasha, she don't hear me. And I'll go, Tasha, and she'll go. Doesn't anyone else like see that in your life? And you're like, I was just yelling at the top of my lungs. But yet when I go, Tasha, she heard me. Is because in our marriage, when I lowered my voice and I whispered, it made her ears focus more for some reason. And I think for some of us, we're just like, God, just yell at me. And, God, and God's like, I'm trying to train you to hear me above the noise of the world, above the noise of your own mind, above the noise of your emotions. I want to train your ears to hear me. That's why he's not always trying to shout at you. Because he's like... Jeremy, why? Because now I can identify my father's voice when there's so much going on. I can hear him. I hear him when he calls. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. God, how, do, how, do, how do you know? How do you know God's talking to you? You know his voice. In the same way you know your mother and father's voice in a crowd, when you start to train your ears to hear God in heaven, you'll know, that you'll know him. And you know what's not his. I always find that God's voice is always a thing that's contrary to my flesh. It's always a thing that, like, in my flesh, I want to do something, and the Lord goes, that's not what I called you to. He heard him in the whisper. He heard him in the whisper. I wonder if God has been trying to whisper to you, but you have not identified his voice as a whisper because you just want it to be loud like everyone else's. But you have to understand, my God's voice does not compete with anyone else's. The tone that he speaks at is to get the attention of his children. Why do you think it says in scripture, Jesus says, the sheep know my voice. I call them by name. They will not go to the hired help because they're not his. I watched a video one time of a shepherd. No, excuse me, I read a book of a shepherd, and he goes, hey, he tells his hired worker, he goes, hey, go 50 feet that way and make this noise. Go, ee, ee, something wild. And the guy goes, he's like, he's like, when you make that noise, the sheep, let's see what the sheep do. He goes over, he makes a noise, and the shepherd starts laughing. And he goes, hey, matter of fact, go 25 feet, go closer, and make the same noise. And he makes the same noise, and the sheep don't do nothing. He's like, I feel so silly right now. I feel so stupid. He goes, hey, you know what? Go closer and make the same noise. And he does it for the third time. And the sheep keep doing what they're doing. And he goes, why do you have me doing this? And then the shepherd makes the noise, and all the sheep come his way. Because the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. In the same way, the father wants you to know his voice so that any impersonating voice gets ignored. 
Any voice that's not of him gets ignored. Even the ones that even sound similar but ain't him gets ignored. Displays, displays power and intimacy. So God shows him this display of power. And then he asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? The second time he asked him, I believe God displays his power just to be like, why are you scared of Jezebel? What are you doing here? The first time he asked him, is like, what are you doing here? That was a self-examination question. The second time he asked him, what are you doing here, is to show him he's God. Why are you here? The wind and the waves and the earthquakes and the fire, they all go by the motion of my hand, by the motion of my thought. What are you doing here? And Elijah I believe now the tone of his voice changed, and he goes, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, and the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. I believe that when he said it the second time, he had to realize who he, realized who he was talking to. They're trying to kill me, too. Anyone have that realization? Like, even in your depression sometimes, like, the Lord is like, what are you doing here? And you're like, Lord, the finances and the kids and the family and the disease, what the doctor said, and blah, and da and da. And God is like, what are you doing here? Am I not the God over disease? Am I not the God over your finances? Am I not the God over your family? Am I not the God over your body? Am I not the God over your job? Am I not the God who brought you from your addiction? Am I not the God who's maintained you when you've been feeling lonely? Am I not the God who brought you out of the sick relationships? Am I not the God that delivered you from whatever cancer was plaguing your body? Am I not that God? I am the same God who shattered the mountains with winds. I'm the same God who caused an earthquake. I'm the same God who produced fire. I'm the same God that through my son rose from the dead with all power and authority and I filled you with the Holy Spirit. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? You see, I believe that it's in the cave of depression that God wants to reveal himself to you through power and intimacy. He reveals himself. To Elijah with power and intimacy. He reminds Elijah who he's serving. Because he doesn't allow Elijah to leave without instruction and without a solution. He doesn't. He says it right here. And the Lord said, go back the way you came. Go through the desert of Damascus. And anoint Hazael, the king over Aram. And anoint um, uh, Jehu, son of Nimshi. He, he's telling him, like, not everyone is going the way of wickedness. I preserved a remnant in Israel. I want you to anoint these two kings. And then he goes, hey, I don't want you to be by yourself and anoint Elisha. Anoint him. He's going to be your successor. And then he says, yet, verse 18, I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed to, bow to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. He told Elijah, your perspective needs to get elevated because I've had this planned out since the beginning of time. You are not by yourself. I always reserve a remnant. I always reserve. If you just listen to me and keep me as close as a whisper, I have worked out all things together for the good of those in Christ Jesus, for the good of those who serve me. I've worked it out. I have 7,000 men. I'm going to have you anoint two kings who are going to get rid of all the wickedness. I'm going to have you anoint a successor. So the way you see things is not the way I see things. Come out of your depression. Come out of that cave. I 
I just say this in the first service, but I believe it needs to be said. The faith of Elijah wasn't that he just came out the, out the cave. That's not faith. The faith is when he went back and did what the Lord told him to do. When he was obedient. Because he could have been like, I don't know if I could trust you. And so maybe, maybe for us, some of us, like the, the reason why depression is like so prevalent in our lives. I'm not talking like the, I'm talking about like this depression that just stays in our lives is because we've heard God say, but we haven't done what God told us to do. Maybe it is the breakup that we're dreading. Maybe it is the job. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's that. Where he says, I wonder if some of the things that we're holding on to is the reasons why we've stayed in this depression. The Lord is like, let it go. Let it go. I have new life for you. Being obedient to the Lord, being obedient. See, the faith comes from doing what he told him to do. Elijah went back. If Elijah would have stayed in the cave, maybe Israel never gets delivered. But Elijah goes back because he's like, no, I've had this intimacy with the Lord. He's risen. He's brought me out of my depression. I know what it's like to feel empty and lonely. But my God is a God who always has a way. He always makes a way where there seems to be no way. He always has a plan. And sometimes you just need to have the faith to listen and do what he called us to do. I understand that some depression needs medication, and I understand that there are some things that are just off in our heart, body, and spirit that just need medication, but I also understand that God cares about my depression. He cares about it. And if we're listening, maybe he's been talking to us the whole time, but we've just allowed every voice to get louder than his. Maybe in the next couple moments, maybe in the next couple days, you hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit go, I'm here. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what you're going through. He's not here to shame you. He's not here to denigrate or demean you. And you could tell him exactly word for word. I just feel lonely. I feel sad. I feel like I'm stuck in the same place. Keep on naming the things. And he goes, I hear you. But hear me. He's also telling you, I have worked all things together for your good. This does not end in sorrow. This ends in victory. Everyone stand with me. Do you guys receive that today? Stand with me. I'm going to have.